scientists battled over the risk and the benefits of gain-of-function research. Essentially, we harvest an influenza virus from current birds that isn't causing a pandemic, and we now try to insert genetic features into that virus that now would enable it to cause a human pandemic. And those in favour claim it could help prevent pandemics by highlighting potential risks and accelerating vaccine development. However, critics argued that creating pathogens that didn't exist in nature ran the risk of unleashing them. So disturbed that this goes on and I don't think it should go on because it's just so intrinsically dangerous. If we are engineering a virus that could wipe out humankind, it, it is literally like we're building the Death Star and if something goes wrong, then everybody dies. On the 16th of November 2002, the first corona epidemic broke out in Guangdong, China. Whether he knows it or not, he is sick, carrying a mysterious new virus. He checks in to the Metropole Hotel, the ninth floor. And over the next 24 hours, he spreads the virus to at least 12 other hotel guests. It lasted eight months, over which period 8,000 people from 29 different countries and territories were infected, and at least 774 died worldwide. In 2004, reports of a lab breach in China began. At the time, China's laboratories were said to be airtight, with safety practices equivalent to those in the US and other developed countries. However, there had been four incidences of SARS-related lab breaches, two occurring at a top laboratory in Beijing. Due to overcrowding there, a live SARS virus that had been improperly deactivated had been moved to a refrigerator in a corridor. A graduate student then examined it in the electron microscope room and sparked another outbreak. In 2012, six miners in the lush mountains of Mojiang County in southern Yunnan province were assigned an unenviable task to shovel out a thick carpet of bat feces on the floor of a mine shaft. After weeks of dredging up bat guano, the miners became gravely ill and were sent to the first affiliated hospital at the Kunming Medical University in Yunnan's capital. Their symptoms of cough, fever, and labored breathing rang alarm bells in a country that had suffered through a viral SARS outbreak a decade earlier. You know, I've read the, the medical thesis and I guess I'm a doctor myself and what's described there, both the patient's symptoms, the course of the disease, their biochemistry and the serology says these miners were infected with a coronavirus. Now, in May 2014, five months before the moratorium on gain-of-function research was announced, EcoHealth secured a National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases grant of roughly $3.7 million, which it allocated in part to various entities engaged in collecting bat samples, building models, and performing gain-of-function experiments to see which animal viruses were able to jump to humans. Later that year, in October, the Obama administration imposed a moratorium on new funding for gain-of-function research projects that could make influenza, MARS or SARS viruses more virulent or transmissible. And it also requires us to continue the same path of basic research that is being done here at the NIH that Nancy uh, is a great example of, so that if and when a new strain of flu, like the Spanish flu, crops up five years from now or a decade from now, we've made the investment. In 2015, Professor Shi Zhengli, often referred to as China's Batwoman, 
a researcher at the Wuhan Institute I've mentioned before, published a report revealing that her team had identified eight coronavirus strains found on bats in the Mojiang mines in China. And the paper says that the coronaviruses from pangolins in the Wuhan market pose more of an immediate threat to human health than the ones her team had found in the mine. Now, a research paper Professor Xi had previously published, gain-of-function experiments proved that the spike protein of a novel coronavirus could infect human cells. And using mice as subjects, they inserted the protein from a Chinese Rufus horseshoe bat into the molecular structure of the SARS virus from 2002, creating a new infectious pathogen. Was it was it kind of was it kind of like mind blowing to you that there's this research being undertaken? Yeah, I don't there think is. many people know about this. Shi Zhengli herself has listed the U.S. government grant support of more than 1.2 million dollars on her curriculum vitae. So, U.S. funding, new virus. That's it. There may and likely will come a time in which we have both an airborne disease that is deadly. We worry that we may yet again have another pandemic, and it is almost inevitable that we will have another pandemic. 2018, Echo Health Alliance was pulling in up to $15 million a year in grant money for the research in Wuhan Institute of Virology from an array of federal agencies including the Defense Department, the Department of Homeland Security, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. I think uh, an epidemic, either naturally caused or intentionally caused, is the most likely thing to cause, say, 10 million excess deaths. Uh, and that it's pretty surprising how little preparedness there is for it. A September 2019 paper in an academic journal by the director of the Wuhan Institute of Virology's BSL-4 laboratory, Yuan Ziming, had outlined safety deficiencies in China's labs. Maintenance cost is generally neglected, he had written. Some BSL-3 laboratories run on extremely minimal operational costs, or in some cases, none at all. On 12 September 2019, the Wuhan Institute of Virology's database of some of the 22,000 virus samples and sequences was taken offline, and this was three months before the official start of the pandemic. Two months later, three researchers from the Wuhan Institute of Virology sought hospital care a month before China reported the first case of COVID-19. The very simple data elements on the ground all point to the likelihood that this virus came from a lab. On December 30th, 2019, the program for monitoring emerging diseases notified the world about a pneumonia of a known cause in Wuhan, China. In January 2020, a Wuhan ophthalmologist named Li Wenliang, who tried to warn his colleagues that the pneumonia could be a form of SARS, was arrested, accused of disrupting the social order, and forced to write a self-criticism. He died of COVID-19 the following month, lionized by the Chinese public as a hero and a whistleblower. I've been your host, Twips. The channel is Intrinsic Kenya. Thank you for sticking through till the end of this long episode. I appreciate that. If you haven't subscribed yet, please consider being part of the family and do give the video a like. Do share it widely. It really helps for the algorithm to pick it up. Also leave me a comment so I can know 
uh, what you liked about the video, what your thoughts were on the whole COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It was a pleasure having you here and I'll see you in the next one. I